All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session, the ABCs of LGBTQ plus allyship. I am your moderator, uh, Brianna McGinnis, and I'm gonna be introducing our presenter, Rachel Adams. Rachel Adams is a faculty member at Howard Community College, where she's deeply involved with advocacy for LGBTQ plus faculty, staff, and students. She identifies as queer and is the proud partner to an active duty transgender soldier. And if you could please make sure you are muted and um, sign into the chat with your full name and institution, we would appreciate it. I'll turn it over to you now, Rachel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I just want to let you know that we have time for questions at the end of the presentation, but I understand that stuff might pop up as we're moving through. You are welcome to ask questions at any time. Please drop them in the chat, and Brianna is going to monitor the chat for us and make sure that I can see everyone's questions. All right. So here we are. We start sessions like this with a little bit of uh, background about why we're here. And you can see some information here from uh, the Trevor Project, which is an LGBTQ youth advocacy organization. And in their 2019 national survey on LGBTQ youth mental health, they found the LGBTQ youth who report having at least one accepting adult in their lives were 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year. And in 2018, the Journal of Adolescent Health found that for transgender youth, chosen name use in more contexts was associated with lower depression, suicidal ideation, and suicidal behavior. So we are here to learn more about LGBTQ allyship because for the LGBTQ community, it can literally be a matter of life and death to have accepting people in their lives. We're gonna start with a little bit about me. My name is Rachel Adams. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm an assistant professor of communication studies at Howard Community College. And just so you know that I know what I'm talking about, I am a member of our diversity, equity and inclusion committee. I'm a member of our safe zone committee, which is our LGBTQ ally program. And I'm also, I just stepped down from being the faculty advisor of our LGBTQ student group, which is the Sexuality and Gender Alliance. And as Brianna mentioned, I am the proud partner to a transgender active duty army soldier. This is Nick right here. And Nick actually began transitioning. He was one of the first people who started transitioning when the military allowed transgender soldiers. So he's kind of been at the forefront of that movement. Before Nick transitioned, um, he identified as female. He was born female. So we were a lesbian couple. Um, when we got married, we were two women. And then he came out as transgender. So the two of us obviously have undergone quite a few changes in the past few years. We've been married for eight years. And we've undergone changes in our identities, changes in the way, obviously, that we appear to other people changes in the way that we relate to one another. So although I am not transgender myself, I do identify as part of the LGBTQ community. So I feel like I have uh, a little bit of expertise in this area. So let's begin by reviewing the gay agenda, which is my favorite joke to make when I do these. We're gonna start out with some definitions. We're gonna talk about labels and we're going to talk about language. Then we're going to go into some challenges that the LGBTQ plus community faces. We're gonna talk about how to be an ally. I have some resources for you. And then finally, time for questions. But again, as we go through the session, if questions pop up, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. So let's begin with the gender unicorn. The gender unicorn was created by this organization called Trans Student Educational Resources. And the gender unicorn exists to explain all of these different aspects of our identities. We have our gender identity, expression, the sex we were assigned at birth, who we are physically attracted to and who we are emotionally attracted to. So let's begin with gender identity. You notice it's in a little thought bubble here because gender identity is how we think of ourselves 
inside our head. So I identify as female. Um, someone else might identify as male, but gender is also a spectrum. There are not just two genders. There are a lot of different ways that someone could identify and think of themselves. I have friends that are non-binary. That means they do not identify with either of the, the two genders as we think of them. We also have people that can be gender fluid. So they might kind of move back and forth with how they feel. Next up is gender expression. That is how we show our gender identity. So again, I identify as female. I tend to dress fairly feminine. You can't see it right now. I have this fabulous rainbow skirt on. Uh, so I do tend to dress uh, feminine, but you can also identify as female and dress more masculine and that's okay. So you can express yourself in a feminine way, in a masculine way, or other, which is also sometimes called androgynous. So we have folks that uh, by looking at them, you cannot immediately tell how they identify. And it's also worth noticing or noting that even if you look at someone and they appear to be dressed in a feminine or a masculine manner, that does not automatically mean that they use he or she pronouns. Um, Non-binary people can also express themselves in feminine or masculine ways. A lot of people assume that if you're non-binary, so you don't identify as male or female, that you have to dress in an androgynous way. But that's not true. I have some non-binary friends who dress more feminine, some who dress more masculine. Then we get to the sex assigned at birth. You might have seen the um, acronyms AFAB or AMAB. That means assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth. So for example, my husband, transgender, but he was assigned female at birth. Um, other folks, I have friends that are transgender women who were assigned male at birth. We also have folks who are intersex, and the intersex identity is also part of the LGBTQ umbrella. We'll get to intersex in a little bit when we look at the acronym. Then we look at who you are physically attracted to. So when you look at somebody and you think, whew, they are cute, does it tend to be more women, more men? Does it tend to be people who are neither? Does it tend to be maybe a little bit of people who are both? Then we also look at who you're emotionally attracted to, because it is possible to be physically attracted, for example, to men, but more emotionally attracted to women. So as we can see from here, gender identity expression and who we're attracted to are very complicated things. And it's really difficult to tell just by looking at someone how they identify. Included in the resources is a video about the gender unicorn. So if I did a really bad job explaining it, the video should help. So let's talk now about our definitions, our labels and our language. We got this acronym. You might've heard it called alphabet soup because that's exactly what it looks like. LGBTQIA plus. So the L is for lesbian which is a woman who is attracted to other women. We have gay, which is traditionally meant to use a man who's attracted to men. We have uh, bisexual, which is someone who is attracted to both men and women. We have someone who's transgender. Again, they were assigned one gender at birth and now they identify as a different gender. The Q stands for queer or questioning. And I love that the Q also stands for questioning because when I was going through my own journey of coming out, I, I wasn't quite comfortable identifying as part of the LGBTQ community yet, but that questioning, I don't know, that just, that fit for me. I really loved it. The I is intersex. The intersex identity is a little complicated, um, but what it basically means is that you might be born with, um, let's say, let me think of how to explain this. We have someone here at HCC who's very open about this. She was born um, identifying as female, but she was born without reproductive organs. So 
that would make her intersex. Um, it could also refer to someone who is born with both sets of genitalia, what we would consider to be male and female external genitalia. The challenge with being intersex is that it used to be common when children were born with, with both sets of genitalia that the doctors and the parents would just choose for them. So for example, if the child might have been born with a penis, the doctor would say, okay, let's just remove that and we'll raise the child as, as a girl. But then when the child gets a little bit older and they start feeling conflicted and they feel like they're not really a girl, right? Like that decision was made for them. They weren't allowed to become, right, who they really are. That's less common now, but it still does happen. And then finally, we have asexuality. And asexuality, that's someone who does not feel sexual attraction at all to anyone. They could be emotionally attracted to people. They could find your personality very attractive, but they don't experience sexual attraction. So one thing that I hear a lot about this acronym is why are there so many letters? And people will say, well, we didn't have all this stuff back in my day. Yeah, we did. We just didn't have words for it. And so we keep adding letters because we keep coming up with words for these identities that people have had for years, but people treated them as though they were wrong or they were disgusting or unnatural. And now we have words for these. So that's why there's a plus at the end of LGBTQIA because there are so many more identities that fall underneath the umbrella of the LGBTQ community. If you have heard of another identity um, and you wanna share it in the chat, or if you've heard of something and you're not quite sure what it means, I can't guarantee you that I'll know what it means either, but drop it in the chat and we'll, we'll figure it out. One thing that I hear a lot from people is they wanna know if they can say certain things. The word queer is a big one. Because I, when I was growing up, queer was an insult and you didn't call anybody that. That was not a good name to call people. But the LGBTQ community, um, some folks have reclaimed the word. You might have heard Brianna in the uh, beginning introduce me as queer. Well, that's because I used to identify as a lesbian, but then the person I was married to transitioned. And it certainly doesn't feel right to identify as straight because I'm not. Um, so that Q, that queer really fits for me. And both of us identify as queer because it just, it just feels right. It fits. So queer is one of those things that people can call themselves, but you should probably not call somebody else that unless you have their permission. Um, some other words that are a little outdated now that we don't use anymore. And just a, a warning, I'm going to say some stuff that's considered uh, offensive now, but that used to be okay to say. Someone who is intersex, we used to call them hermaphrodites. We don't call them that anymore. That is intersex. Um, and the word hermaphrodite referred to someone who was born, again, with both sets of external genitalia. If someone is transgender, we do not call them transsexual. We do not call them a transvestite. Again, those were words that we used to use in the past to describe folks, um, and we don't use those anymore. And we certainly do not use the word tranny to refer to anyone who is transgender. That is a huge insult. Um, so if you're unsure of what to call somebody, you can always ask them. And I think most members of the LGBTQ community would rather that you just ask than risk calling them something wrong. But um, you might think, well, why do we need all these labels anyway, right? Why can't people just be people? When I was first figuring out who I was and I came out later in life, I can't even describe to you how good it felt to know that there was a word for what I felt and for who I was. And then that word was lesbian. When you've gone your whole life feeling like you don't really fit in and there's something wrong with you because you don't like the same things that other people might like or um, you don't know anybody else that's like you, 
finding that label, finding that word, and knowing that there are other people who feel just like you is euphoric. It's incredible. So that's why we use labels. Some folks in the LGBTQ community will say they don't want to be labeled, and that's okay. That's their right. But for some folks, it's wonderful to have a word that describes what you are and how you feel. And this is my, my little uh, PSA to all of you. Our language is changing all the time. Um, I am used to be the advisor for our Sexuality and Gender Alliance, and students were always telling me how they identified. And a lot of times it was something I had never heard before, and I had to Google it. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that you are not an ally. That doesn't mean that you're not supportive. It just means we are always coming up with new words for things. So if somebody identifies in a way that you're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> The best recourse is probably to smile and say, okay, thank you, and then go Google it later. <laughs> or you can ask them what it means if you feel comfortable doing so. All right. So I told you we were going to talk about definitions and labels and language. So let's talk a little bit about language. The American culture has a lot of heteronormative language and assumptions built into it. And heteronormative means that our culture tends to assume that everyone is heterosexual. So I'm gonna give you a second to drop in the chat. Can you think of any examples of heteronormative language or assumptions that we make in American culture? Oh, good. So when we say parents, we tend to think that means a mom and a dad. Good. The phrase ladies and gentlemen, very good. Good. I'm normally asked who my husband is when they ask if I'm married. Excellent. Yes. Okay, I have some other examples. If you think, yes, if you say the word partner, that automatically assumes not a husband or a wife. Good. I have a friend who she's bisexual and she is married to a man and she very purposely uses the word spouse to normalize using spouse or partner instead of husband or wife. So that that way, when someone else in the LGBTQ community says partner or spouse, it doesn't seem as, as strange, for lack of a better word. Most references to romance or dating are, yeah, boy, girl, or male, female. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, good. Yeah, keep them coming. Keep them coming. We'll move to the next slide, but if you've got more, put them in there. So we address this one, the assumption that if you're in a relationship, it must be a heterosexual one. We also got this one, addressing a group of people as ladies and gentlemen, or you guys. I know a lot of folks tend to say you guys, and they don't literally mean that you are a group of men, uh, but I have a, a transgender friend. Um, she's a trans woman, and she hates the phrase you guys, because for her, she doesn't know if someone is just casually addressing the group or if they really think that she looks like a man and it's a, a group of men. So that's one that she really, she really doesn't like. We tend to assign pronouns to people based upon their appearance. And we touched on that in the gender unicorn, that someone who is dressed feminine or masculine is not necessarily a she or a he, they could be a they. They could use um, what are called neo pronouns. And we'll touch on those a little bit later. If a teenager comes out, we tend to brush it off as a phase. One of my pet peeves is when folks 
Um, for example, if there's a little boy and a little girl playing on the playground, right, they'll say, oh, is that your girlfriend? But then they'll say, oh, but this child's too young to understand same-sex relationships, right? So it's that heteronormativity that's like almost, um, that surrounds children. And then if a young child or a teenager comes out, we'll say, oh, you're too young to know. But if that same child were to date someone of a the different gender, we'd be fine with that, right? So we tend to see that as a, as a phase. Oh. This is a big one. My best friend just got married last weekend. My younger brother is getting married in July. So I have been in a lot of wedding shops. And let me tell you, I kind of make it a point when I go into the wedding shops to see if there is any example of a same-sex couple in there. I have not found any. So uh, we talked about that, romantic relationships being assumed to be heterosexual. When my partner and I got married, like I said, we both identified as women. This was also before 2015. So it was before same-sex marriage was legal in all of the United States. And we didn't live in this area at the time. Uh, we were living in Kentucky. So we had to travel to get married. We had to travel to a place where it was legal. So that was Washington, DC. And as I was looking for wedding vendors, um, I can't tell you how stressful that was because you never know when you contact a wedding vendor, if they're going to say, right, we hear the stories. I refuse to make a cake for you because you're gay. I refuse to do this for you because you're gay. So I looked for wedding vendors. I think I searched like LGBTQ friendly wedding vendors. And some of the folks, especially in DC, would have little rainbow flags on their websites, or they would say, we are welcoming of all couples. And that was just such a relief. Um, so a lot of things that folks take for granted um, that are in heterosexual relationships is something that's really a struggle for folks that are in same-sex relationships. And then we also have media portrayal of LGBTQ characters. This is getting better, but when I was growing up, first of all, there wasn't really any portrayal of them. Um, but if there was, it was comic relief, or they were stereotypically, right, the flamboyant gay man, or someone who was very feminine, or if you had a gay woman, she was very masculine, and they were the butt of all of these jokes. Um, so that's really difficult. If you can't see yourself in the media that you're consuming, um, it just, again, makes you feel like you don't belong anywhere. I got a, a private question in the chat, which is an excellent question. What is a good way to address a group without using ladies and gentlemen or you guys? So I just, so I lived in Kentucky for about 10 years. So I tend to say y'all. Uh, at HCC, our mascot is the dragon. So when I welcome my students, I say, good morning, dragons. Uh, you can also say, I also call them friends. Like, oh, good morning, friends, or hello, colleagues. Those are all good examples. Yeah. Hi, all. Hey, everyone. <laughs> but I think ladies and gentlemen is so ingrained in us because it's considered like a polite way to welcome people. But I had a group of students once. We got to the very end of the semester. And I said, it was the same thing. The student worked at a hotel. And he said, but I need to be formal, right? How can I welcome people being formal without saying things like sir or ma'am or ladies and gentlemen? And I said, did you notice that I have not referred to you, to all of you as ladies and gentlemen the entire semester? And he was like, well, yeah, yes, you did. And I said, no, go back and look at the announcements. Think about it. Every time I've greeted you, it has been with a non-gender specific greeting and you didn't even notice. So I think it's one of those things where we feel like it's gonna be a huge deal. And you're right, we have a comment in the chat. It is really difficult to drop this stuff from your vocabulary. It took me forever to drop you guys. That was really, really hard. Um, but you just keep reminding yourself. And if I make a mistake, which I still do, you just apologize and you keep going. Good. So these are just some of the examples of the way that heteronormativity is kind of built into 
our, our culture. All right, moving on. Let's talk about some of the challenges that folks in the LGBTQ community uh, face. First of all, the aforementioned language, right? And the cultural assumptions that surround you. Secondly, access to and cost of medical care. So not only mental health care, because the LGBTQ community does have a higher rate of anxiety and depression than the general population, but also medical care for transgender folks. Uh, my husband is fine with me sharing this with people. His chest surgery, so that is surgery to remove his, his breasts and um, masculinize his chest. So it's not a mastectomy, um, they actually reconstruct the chest so that it does look masculine. It was $8,000. And that's on the low end of what some procedures cost for transgender people. Um, and we paid for that out of pocket. So especially for transgender folks, cost and access can be a huge hurdle. If we were still living in Kentucky, I, I don't know what we would do. We would have to travel to a different state because gender affirming care is not typically available in Kentucky. So we're very lucky to be here in Maryland. We have legal matters. Uh, my husband legally changed his name. Because he was born in Washington, DC, it was easy for him to change the gender on his birth certificate. But he still needed a couple, he needed letters, he needed uh, stuff from a psychologist, he needed all sorts of things. But again, if we still lived in Kentucky, Kentucky requires you to have gender affirming surgery before you can have your, um, gender marker changed. And some folks, A, either don't want that, or B, it's too expensive, or C, you live in Kentucky, there's nowhere to go to get it. So I have a friend in Kentucky who has changed his name, like has a, a big beard, he's a trans man, but his driver's license still says female because Kentucky will not let him change it. So there's legal matters, there's my husband, Nick, carries around this huge binder full of all of his paperwork so that he can prove to people that, yes, this used to be his name. This is his name now. And because he's in the military, if you know anything about the military, it is heavily separated by gender. So he has to now meet different physical fitness standards. Um, he is housed with men in the barracks, right? Um, there's all these different legal matters that, again, cost money. And if you don't have money, it can be really difficult to uh, get these things done. There's anti-LGBTQ legislation. I am sure the photo here is from uh, a protest of anti-transgender legislation in Texas that happened earlier this year. There's anti-trans legislation in Florida. It is all over the place from the don't say gay bill to all of this legislation that's coming out telling parents, we're going to arrest you if you have a transgender child because that's child abuse. So all of these things, very difficult to navigate. You have rejection from your family. I was a grown woman when I came out as a lesbian and I still lost the support of some of my family members. And even though I was not financially dependent upon them, it still really hurt. So if you are a young kid, if you're a teenager, we have students here at HCC in Columbia, Maryland, who can't come out to their parents because they know they'll be kicked out and cut off and they, they can't afford to do that. So risking that family rejection. And the fact that when you are a part of the LGBTQ community, you have to come out over and over and over again. You have your big coming out, right? And you tell everyone that's close to you, but then every time you meet someone, right? It's up to you whether you wanna come out or not, you don't have to. But if they start making those assumptions, like you have a husband or you have a wife, right? You're gonna probably wanna correct them. And every time you come out, you have to risk their rejection. You have to risk that they're going to say something. You have to risk, unfortunately, that they might be violent toward you. I have some transgender friends who are dating and they say it's terrifying because you're trying to meet someone, but you have no idea 
whether that person is actually going to accept you or whether once you tell them, they're going to have a negative reaction to it. And then this also goes along with it, having to defend and explain your identity to people who don't support you. Um, you might have to tell someone if you're non-binary and they say, but you dress feminine. All right, so let me explain that being non-binary is not necessarily, you know, guarantee that I'm dressed androgynous, right? So you always have to defend, you always have to explain your identity to people over and over and over again. And that gets exhausting. Hold on, I see we have something in the, in the chat. Okay, so I have a question. A good way to refer to your adult child who is queer when speaking about them to another person without using son or daughter. Um, well, if your child identifies as, you know, male or female and they're okay with son or daughter, that's fine. But uh, you can also just say my child, and that works too. Uh, I do notice that when I refer to Nick as my partner or my spouse, people will start to like fish for pronouns. Um, so that is something that you, you might have to learn to navigate if your child maybe uses they, them pronouns or doesn't identify um, as part of the gender binary. There's a lot of figuring out how to dance around those, those delicate questions. All right, so this is why allyship matters. I'll be honest with you. I mentioned earlier that I am the former advisor of the Sexuality and Gender Alliance. I just stepped down this year. I've been doing it for six years. I'm exhausted. And this is why we need allies because people in this community are tired. We're really tired and we need people to step up and defend us and help us. So some things that you can do to be a good ally are to normalize pronouns. I am a cisgender woman. So that means I was born assigned female at birth. I identify as female. I give my pronouns because that normalizes giving pronouns for everybody else. So when I introduce myself on the first day of class and I say, hey, my name's Professor Adams. My pronouns are she and her. You know, let's rock and roll. That then lets students know that they can feel comfortable coming to me and telling me their pronouns are they, them, or that maybe um, they use a different name than the one that's on the roster, that kind of thing. So the more we can normalize giving our own pronouns, the easier it becomes for folks who are in the LGBTQ community. You can display flags or pins or stickers in your office if you could see my entire office, this is like the gayest room on campus. There are flags everywhere. I have, I don't think you can see it, but this little pin right here is a pronoun pin. So it says she and her. I have rainbow ribbons. I've, I've got it everywhere. And it works. This semester alone, I had three students who knocked on my door because they saw that I have a safe zone sticker and I also have a rainbow sticker that says y'all means all on my door. And they came in and said, is, is this a safe space? Can I talk to you? Sure, absolutely. If you have any sort of safe zone training through your institution, take it. Safe zone is what we call it here at HCC. I know other institutions have other names for it, but um, when you go through the safe zone training at HCC, you do get a little sticker to put on your door that identifies you as an ally. So students know that if they need somebody to talk to, they can come to you. Use inclusive language. So like we talked about being careful to not use things like ladies and gentlemen or not say things like you guys. Stand up for the LGBTQ people in your life. As I mentioned before, we're tired. Um, defending your identity constantly, hearing about everything that's happening in different states, in the media, it's hard. It's really hard. And so having people that'll stand up for you, whether or not you're in the room, is really, really important. So, you know, when that one family member at Thanksgiving starts ranting about something, 
it's okay to stand up and, and defend the LGBTQ folks in your life. You can also learn about issues that affect us. Um, so again, things like we just passed the anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting, where I believe almost 50 people died at a gay club because somebody went in and just started, started shooting. Um, so learn about those sorts of things. What are the LGBTQ people in your life going through? And apologize when you get it wrong. We're going to get it wrong. I get it wrong all the time. Like I said before, language is constantly changing. New identities are emerging. There are different ways to identify. You're going to get it wrong. That's okay. Uh, I have a friend who identified as non-binary for a while, so used they, them pronouns, but decided to transition, so now is using he, him pronouns. And I forget all the time, <laughs> all the time. And all you need to do is if you say, oh, they, I'm sorry, he, just keep going. I think the bigger fuss that people make about making a mistake the worse it is, right? Because if I were to call my friend they, and then I said, oh my gosh, I'm just so sorry. This is just hard. I'm really trying, but you know, you just change the way that you identify and it's hard because I'm used to this. And that, that makes the other person feel terrible. That makes them feel like a burden, right? You don't have to do the whole huge apology. You can just say, I'm sorry, correct yourself and move on. Allyship matters. Uh, this picture is from a group called Free Mom Hugs, and then they have Free Dad Hugs. And I love this group. So Free Mom Hugs is a group of moms and Free Dad Hugs is a group of dads. And they go to pride parades and events wearing shirts that say Free Mom Hugs and Free Dad Hugs. And they exist because so many of the LGBTQ community does not have support from their own parents. And I've gotten free mom hugs and free dad hugs, and they're wonderful. They're wonderful. So this here in the gray shirt here, this is the person from free dad hugs. His name is Howie Dittman. And you can just see the emotion, these complete strangers that are hugging him because he's wearing a shirt that says, I'm a dad and I will hug you. So this is why allyship matters. So you can be aware of local resources, not only for the LGBTQ people in your life, but also for yourself, just to learn more. Donate to organizations like the Trevor Project, like the Human Rights Campaign. Um, there are legal funds for transgender folks that will help them with all of that expensive name change documentation or surgeries or things like that. And you can get involved. So. There might just be a free mom hugs uh, chapter. There is one for Maryland. Free dad hugs is a little bit harder to find. They're usually attached to free mom hugs. You can go to P Flag here in Howard County. Our local P Flag chapter is incredibly active. They do a lot of stuff. You can go to local pride celebrations, maybe volunteer to help out or just be there to support people. If your workplace has a diversity committee or an LGBTQ organization, you can get involved there. And you can also write letters to lawmakers. It's important that they hear from everyone, not just folks in the LGBTQ community. So I do have some resources for you here. And the Trevor Project is an LGBTQ youth advocacy organization. The Trevor Project runs a suicide hotline. Um, where you can call or you can chat. So they're a very important organization. There's a website called My Pronouns. I give this to my students every semester. Um, I'll put a little thing in the syllabus that says, why does Professor Adams give her pronouns? And I link to this website. It explains why we give pronouns, what they are, the different pronouns that people can use. Uh, Glisten is a resource. It's for K through 12 educators, but there's really good stuff on there. The Human Rights Campaign, that's the one that folks are usually the most familiar with. We have uh, the Gender Unicorn video that I talked to you about earlier, Free Mom Hugs, and P Flag are all on here. And these are all links, so you can click them, and I'll share this uh, presentation with everybody. 
And finally, questions. We have about 20 minutes for questions. So if you've got them, drop them in the chat. Um, I had a, a direct message that said, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the safe zone training? Yes, at HCC, the safe zone training is a really comprehensive training that tells you more about the different identities that are under the LGBTQIA umbrella. It tells you about the resources that are here on campus. Again, it tells you about the challenges and the struggles that the community faces. So it's kind of like this training except expanded. And then once you go through the training, you get that little sticker that you can put on your door. And as part of being a safe zone ally, you agree to continue to educate yourself on all of the different identities under the LGBTQ umbrella. Because again, there are always new ones, there's always new information coming out. So it's important to keep up with it. So yes, the link for the pronouns is in the presentation and I'll go ahead and send that out after. So you all have that. What other questions do we have? Oh, this is a good one. The importance of not outing people. So does anyone know what it means to out someone? You can drop that in the chat if you want. Do we know what it means to out somebody? Yes, very good. It means to share their sexual or gender identity without their consent. So it's important not to out people because you never know what that person is going through. You don't know if they've already told people or if there's a reason that they're not telling people. Um, maybe they're just trying to live their lives and they don't want the stress of having to come out to anybody. Maybe they don't want their parents to know. Maybe they're just not ready to come out yet. One of the things that we do in the Sexuality and Gender Alliance is we always begin our meeting with names and pronouns. We wear little name tags, right, so that we can remember everybody's name and pronouns. But we also ask students, is it okay to call you this outside of this meeting? Or we'll say to them, uh, we, we tell our students, if you see someone from this meeting on campus, you can say hi to them, but don't run up and be like, oh my gosh, I saw you at the saga meeting and it was so great. And we talked about all this stuff because you don't know if the people they're with know that they went to the saga meeting. Maybe they don't want people to know that they were there. So we're always very, very careful to not let other people know um, unless you know they're okay with it. Just so everybody knows, I do have like blanket consent from my husband <laughs> to talk about his identity and everything that uh, we have been through as a married couple. So that's okay with him. But I do still check with him every now and then to make sure, is it still okay that, you know, I'm doing this training and I'm gonna mention this or he can revoke that consent at, at any time and that'll be okay. So do you have any analogy examples to help people who just say, I am so tired of trying to accommodate all these different terms that are new to them? Something I can use to gently help um, maybe more conservative friends understand. Yeah, this is a frustration. Um, this is a frustration. I wonder if it would help Sometimes I point out to my students how much our language has changed. Um, when we talk about language in class, the activity that I use is give me a sentence that makes sense to you now, but would not have made sense to me when I was your age. And so sometimes it's slang, sometimes um, they'll talk about maybe the, the Twin Towers, you know, 9-11 or something like that, because when I was their age, I didn't know what 9-11 was because it hadn't happened yet. Or they might talk about, you know, the internet or cell phones or, or 
something. And we use that as an example to talk about how our language changes constantly. Even with the pandemic, we had to invent all of these new words because stuff was happening that had never happened before. So maybe it might help if you could point out to them that we use new words all the time. And this is just another instance of using a new word. Um, I also have seen this online and I like it because people will say, well, I just don't understand. I don't understand Korean, but I know it's a language. You don't have to understand somebody's gender identity or their sexual orientation to treat them like a human being that is deserving of respect. I hope that helps. Would you speak a bit about the bathroom controversy? Yes, I would love to. So, there are, there's a lot of talk about um, the restrooms. Here at HCC, our policy is students may use the restroom that aligns with their gender identity. No questions asked, right? Uh, but students will still ask me, well, what do I do if I go into the restroom and it's, it's somebody's there that shouldn't be there? And I say, well, if they're just using the bathroom and minding their own business, leave them alone, right? Um, they know better than you do what bathroom is the right one for them. Now, by all means, if anybody in a bathroom is being creepy, right? Because that's the logic that they try to use is, oh, a man's just gonna put a dress on and walk into the ladies room to listen. If some creepy person wants to go into the bathroom and spy on people, that little sign on the door is not gonna stop them. They're gonna do it. Um, but trans folks need to use the bathroom just like any of us do. And that's another challenge that faces the transgender community. Uh, I remember when my husband first started using the men's room and I was terrified. I was terrified. Um, we went to the mall once and he was like, okay, I'm gonna go into the restroom. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'll wait for you on this bench. And he said, go, go get yourself an ice cream cone. Like, don't worry, I'll be fine. So I'm sitting on the bench with my ice cream cone and I heard yelling coming from the men's room. And it turns out that it was some kids. They were just playing and splashing water on each other and whatever. And the kids came out and I was like, okay, it was just the kids. But when Nick came out, I was sitting on the bench crying, holding my ice cream cone because I thought that something had happened to him. We all have to use the bathroom. Most of us don't think twice about it. Um, so I just, I tell people, if you see someone that you think doesn't belong in the bathroom, keep your mouth shut because for a transgender person, just going to the bathroom, which is something that all of us have to do multiple times a day, is a very, very stressful thing. Um, at HCC, we are lucky. We have all gender restrooms in every building. Uh, we actually just like the week before the pandemic opened up a huge all gender restroom in one of our buildings. They basically just kind of knocked down the wall between the men's and the women's room and turned it into a, a big space. And I tell folks all the time, because they'll say, well, what if I don't want to go to the all gender restroom? Don't, you don't have to. But if that's a place where you would feel comfortable, then, then go, that's okay. So if somebody's just minding their business, just leave them, just leave them alone. It's okay. Um, a quick, yeah. Oh, Wendy, that's something I noticed in the chat. It says Starbucks has been that way for years. This is a hill that I will die on. There is no reason for any single occupancy restroom to be marked male or female. If it's just a room with a toilet in it, why does it have to be male or female? Uh, I worked at Trader Joe's and we had two single occupancy restrooms that just said restroom. <laughs> and Starbucks is the same way, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, there's no reason if it's if it's single occupancy to have it marked male or female. Um, I have a private question that says, do all faculty give their pronouns at the beginning of class? No, no, they don't. Um, this is something that I'm working on uh, when I do these trainings, I encourage people to do it. I understand that it can feel uncomfortable. I understand 
that it's a little scary because it might bring up reactions from students. I've never had a negative reaction from a student um, when I give my pronouns. If they want to give theirs, they can. If they don't, they don't have to. And when I say my pronouns are she, her, most of them just kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, but it's not a thing that all of our faculty do. But I am noticing that a lot more of them do. Or, you know, we have those lanyards with our IDs on them. They'll put a pronoun pin on there or on the bag that they take to class or something like that. So it is becoming a lot more normalized. <laughs> I love this. Before you approach someone in the bathroom, you should ask yourself, have you washed your hands yet? That gives you some time to reflect on whether it's really necessary to say anything. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. Ooh, how do you politely fish for pronouns? Mm. I understand how this one can be can be challenging. It feels very impolite to say to someone, can I ask what your pronouns are? Uh, I get that because it sets you up for that person then being upset, right? They might be upset or they might um, not understand what you're asking or, or something like that. <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I usually will just say, you know, I'm Rachel, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and if they introduce themselves and share their pronouns, that's awesome. A lot of times if we model it, they'll do the same. Um, but if somebody doesn't share theirs, I might privately ask, uh, do you mind sharing your, your pronouns with me? Um, but you're right, it is kind of a vulnerable question because it does it does open you up to maybe somebody's going to be upset with you for, for asking that. Um, but I find a lot of folks in the LGBTQ community um, appreciate that, that you asked. Yeah. And another important thing is I don't ever force my students to share their pronouns. They can if they want to. They don't have to. They don't have to. Um, but I also set an expectation at the beginning of class that they can always come to me if I ever inadvertently say something offensive, if I ever inadvertently you know, misgender them or use the wrong name, they understand that they can come to me and I will not, I'm not gonna yell. I'm not gonna tell you you're disrespectful. I will apologize and I'll change um, for next time. But that is, yeah, that's tough, that's tough. What do you think of using they as a generic pronoun in the classroom? I often just default to that. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Um, if you're giving an example, then yeah, I'll just use they as a pronoun because that also helps normalize it. Um, some folks don't like they, them pronouns because they're grammatically incorrect. Uh, but as the Merriam-Webster Dictionary shares every single Pride Month, the singular they has been around a long time. It's been around a long time and it is grammatically correct. Um, but I do understand that it can be difficult to get your brain into that setting of using they for one person. I get that, um, but with some practice, yeah. Oh yeah, one of my biggest pet peeves is she slash he did this. When you could just remove that by saying they, they did this. That's very true. And yes, it's my understanding this recording will go up on YouTube. So it will be available later. Do we have any other questions? I'm gonna go back and check direct messages to make sure. Oh, does HCC or any other colleges have programs or provisions to help students not be bigoted against the LGBT community. I'm thinking of a situation in which a student is uncomfortable upon finding out the instructor is gay, lesbian, or transgender. Hmm. At HCC in the fall, we're doing something called Tunnel of Awareness, which is not just for LGBTQ community, but there's sections that are on um, racism and 
um, all sorts of different identities. And the tunnel of awareness is kind of this immersive experience where you can learn more about other identities and how to support them. Uh, but this is a good question. I have had students express opinions in the classroom that uh, you know they don't like gay people or they think that gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married or you know whatever. Uh, and I just kind of, you're allowed to think that and I'm not gonna penalize you because you, you think that. I've never had a student express to me that they're uncomfortable with my identity, but I do acknowledge that it's certainly a possibility that they could be. Um, I guess above all, I just hammer respect in my classroom. You don't have to agree with the other person. You don't have to understand um, how that other person identifies, but you do have to respect them. Yeah. That's also a, a tough one. I imagine that there probably have been some students that were uncomfortable, um, but if they were, they didn't they didn't express it to me. Any other questions? Mm. Thank you all. Lots of thank yous in the chat. You were all wonderful. I am hoping to offer another session in the fall. Uh, and I would love to hear from any of you, my email address is here. I would love to hear from any of you if there's anything I didn't cover that you'd like to more know, know more about. Um, if there's anything that you know about that I didn't mention. Yeah, please feel free to email me. Um, and yes, Julie, you said in other parts of the country, it's much harder to have a climate of respect than it is in Howard County. Yeah. Like I said, I, I came here from Kentucky and in Kentucky, it is perfectly legal to fire someone or deny them housing or deny them service because they are a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, we don't have any protections like that in the state of Kentucky. Luckily, I worked for a college that did have those protections. Um, so I felt fairly safe, but not everybody has that luxury. I was not honest with my students in Kentucky about who I was and who my partner was because I felt like I would probably get a lot more pushback there um, than I would than I would here. It's tough. It's tough. All right. Excellent. Brianna, take it away. No, that's it. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate your uh, session. You're getting lots of praise in the chat. chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. For anyone that needs the uh, information for your professional development, feel free to screenshot the slide that I'm sharing. And thank you all for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. And I see you HCC people. Thank you for coming. <laughs>